Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. Is Greg Proops. This is Bryce Vine. This Mine. is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this East. This is Sebastian Younger. This is Daryl This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mitchell Lepp. This is Andy Summers. This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. This week's album fight is a nine-round battle across genres that is sure to be a scorcher. In the red corner, we have the return of the comic book style characters of KISS with their seventh studio album from 1979, Dynasty. Dynasty. And their opponent in the blue corner, we have the synth pop sounds of Eurythmics with their breakthrough second album from 1983, Sweet Sweet Dreams. Dreams. Let's get ready to ramble. Take it away, gentlemen. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Joining me today for this album fight are two men who should know better. <laughs> to my right, your left. A constant album fight contributor off the mic and starting to become a regular on it, a man who earned his nickname at a sorority house at SF State after a legendary incident involving a yogurt smoothie enema. Very, very, very Mike LaPerry. And on my left, spending one of his grand total of 21 days home from the road this year <laughs> with us. A man who put the backstage in Backstage Manager, and I mean that in the dirtiest way, Scott Pelkey. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah, let's look backstage up on Urban Dictionary just to see what that means. He, I, a, I think you and I both know what it means. There's my face in a double fold-out picture. I never heard it called that before, <laughs> but you call it whatever you want. Thanks for joining me, gentlemen, and for our pre-fight analysis, the always thoughtful and every once in a while dead-ass wrong Richard Lackey. Take it away, Richard. When I heard we were doing this fight, I was like, what? Oh, wow, that's different. That's actually kind of weird. I love it. See, so far we've done the big, big albums for the most part, and this one isn't that exactly. But that's okay, because these are the majority of the albums. These are those little gems that some people just love because they came out at just the right time, or it has that one song that's so important to them. And while Sweet Dreams is a pretty definitive album for the Eurythmics, I'm not so sure it's their best. And Dynasty, we'll go into this a little bit more in depth in a bit, isn't Kiss's best either. But it does have Kabuki Heavy Metal Disco, and what's not to love about that? This fight is so weird that they may have just broken our patent-pending system of analysis. Let's have a look. First off, hands down, when looking at the popularity and sales numbers, Kiss wins outright. Not staggeringly high numbers, but enough. On the other hand, the critics' numbers skew pretty strongly for Sweet Dreams. The problem, though, what made me pump the brakes on outright handing this one to Kiss is the critical number difference was very significant. Like one point on a five-point scale, and that's just not something that I see very often in the numbers. So I decided I need to take a little deeper look, and two things struck me and made me come to the decision. Point one, Sweet Dreams is a Rolling Stone Top 500 album, and Dynasty is not. Point two, after digging a bit deeper, I found an article polling KISS fans about their 10 favorite KISS albums, and Dynasty wasn't on that list. So I looked at it this way. Not even KISS fans would say this is a favorite album of theirs. So how can that compete with the Rolling Stone 500 album? And with that, I used the human element, and I'm saying Sweet Dreams 5-4, to four, but I wouldn't be surprised if it goes to 6-3. to three. I'm stepping away from the numbers a bit this week. Let's see if I'm right. Back to you guys. Now, these albums are in the ring today because we love and respect them and the place they occupy in our memories and our emotions. Yes, we're going to pick winners and we're going to pick losers in these rounds, but please know that we have all the love and respect in the world for the artists and their works that we feature. And if we piss you off because we've chosen something you love as the loser of a round or of the album fight, well then, come and do one of these with us and see how much you end up loving the artists who've graced the records that we've done and how much fucking work this is. Go again. Yeah, seriously. So, let's jump right in. Round one. 
Love is a Stranger versus I Was Made for Loving You. Scott, you're the guest in the room. Start us off, sir. The first track, I Was Made for Loving You? Yeah. By Kiss. Mm-hmm. It was a horrible way to start out an album. It's completely overproduced, and it's it's Kiss trying to be disco. Wow. Which everybody was at that time. So, and the rhythmics, you know, like I said, we're talking about two different genres, the uh, rhythmics. With their first track, it comes, it's interesting, because it's new. It's synth pop. Yeah. It's, you know, they were kind of on the, the tip of that. So, 810, Arrhythmics. Wow. So That's a knockdown round. It is a knockdown round. Starting That's how I... the knockdown. Uh, kisses it's, on it's their a, knees kisses already. First round, they're already on their knees. Yeah. How'd you score it, Mike? Love is a Stranger is a great start to the album. It's really setting the listener That's up for what's exactly coming next. exactly what I said. Yeah. Right yeah. Okay. Uh, they've got some depth, which there's some songs in... Sweet Dreams that don't have a whole lot of depth to them. This is not one of them. Yeah. And Annie Lennox is showing us her, her vocal chops from the first minute of this song. Yeah, which they're, are amazing. They're laying it down. And uh, you look over across the ring, and it is Kiss Does Disco. It was a hit, and I hate to say this song stuck in my head after the album fight. It did. But I still just don't really like it. It's certainly not one of my favorite Kiss songs. Yeah. So it's stuck in my head too. Yeah, it was the I one could, that, like, when I got out of the shower this morning, I found myself going, mm, 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 mm. "Oh shit!" Yeah, there were a couple, and of I was mad about it. <laughs> there were a couple of earworms in the in these two yeah. albums. Uh, catchy and memorable, but not not nearly good enough to beat "Love Is a Stranger." Eurythmics ten nine. Wow. Okay. Well, the thing about "Love Is a Stranger" that bugged me was it was released by Eurythmics. It took about two years to catch on. It floated out around for two years nobody heard it they put it on this album it signals some of the cornerstones of edm the mechanical four on the floor beat the colorful melodic tonally wide accompanying track like that melody bounced all over the place and and that was kind of cool annie lennox on top of it her vocal richness you know like you said she showed us the chops from the very beginning and there's organic contrast between her voice and the electronic music. And I kind of like that. So that was good. In terms of vocal ability and execution, you know, it's Paul Stanley. He gets his ass handed to him in a sandwich bag. But for the sheer audacity to do a song like this, this is what I leaned on Kiss for. Because this is the year that Casablanca Records told Kiss, this is what we need you to do. Okay? They needed a disco record. Casablanca signed Kiss. There was their first act that Casablanca Records signed. Neil Bogart signed Kiss as his first band. And then, as the years went on, Kiss started to get buried by the disco bands that were on Casablanca Records, and Casablanca was the premium disco label. So at some point, they were going to have to say, hey guys, we're making all this money and we like all this cocaine. <laughs> so uh, we're going to need you to step it up. We're going to take you to this place. And show you what we're doing and uh, drag them out to Studio 54 and show them how all the people uh, really dig it. So they went for it. I was made for loving you as the product. We look at it as terrible now, but it is an earworm. And it, I voted for it 10 9 against a two year old song and Love wow. is a Stranger. Yeah. So round two <laughs> I've got an angel versus 2000 man. Now, this is a tough round. Both of these tracks are why the skip button was invented, if you ask me. <laughs> 2000 Man is a Stones cover that sounds like it was recorded in a one-car garage in Levittown, Pennsylvania on Scoop Brady's portable tape recorder. You remember that tape recorder from the Brady Bunch episode? With Peter they, Scoop? they recorded it on that, I'm positive. The thing is, it wasn't. These sessions were split between Electric Lady and the record plant in New York. So they had top-notch facilities, and... For what you made as a comment in round one, Scott, about this album being overproduced, I get that because it lacked the raw rock and roll edge. But for other records that were on Casablanca at the time, it was the most underproduced. Right. So, Just because of the whole, yeah, disco yeah, was and, and super so it produced. sort of did nothing right. Yeah. From that standpoint. So are you going for raw? If you're going for raw, then don't try to overproduce it. And if you're right. going for overproduce it, then fucking plug it in and go. You're at right. If you're going to go, you're at go the record plant. Right. Yeah. 
But that's see, that's what I liked about Two Thousand Man is that it seemed to me like we were talking about a little rawer than the rest of the album. Yeah, maybe because that's Ace Frehley's in, influence. Well, or, or, or uh, who who sang that? Yeah, Ace sang it. Two Thousand Man, right? Yeah, I, it was Ace. Yeah. I yeah. liked, I liked the Ace Frehley songs on this album. Right, um, I do too. The thing is, I've got an angel. Sounds like the intro to a concert. It's sort of the build up, the fanfare that precedes the toaster popping. This is me talking to backstage manager Scott Pelkey. Do you, the acts that you worked with, they don't have that big like Michael Jackson opening where he comes shooting out of the stage on the toaster. No, right? no not at all. So there yeah. isn't that. But you know the build up, right, is coming on yeah. on I've got an angel, and and that's what it sounds like to me. And it and then it doesn't really pay off if you think of it as that uh, because it never has the toaster pop. Nevertheless, it is still technically and I think sonically and by virtue of it not being a cover, creatively superior to 2000 Man, which was a Stones song that the Stones did better. So I scored it. I've got an Angel 10-9. What did you do, Scott? You're about to rake me over the coals. No, 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 no. <laughs> not at all. See, for me, with the I've got an Angel. I didn't like the opening rhythm at all. I don't like the percussion, mm. the way they're doing it. To me, it just... The vocals were kind of not... They were a little everywhere okay. to me, it seemed like, and and the song didn't go anywhere for me. It just it, it was just kind of a long intro. Like like you were talking about, that build-up. Yeah. But it never really panned out. Yeah. And but you the, really needed it to do it that. It really needed it. Yeah. You know, after after the, their first really strong opening song, it just kind of nosedived. Okay. To, in my opinion, with their second song. Now, see, 2000 Man I liked much better, even though it is a Stones okay. cover, because it's a little grittier. And I think that's an Ace Freely influence, yeah, and I like sure. his singing okay. on it. I don't know. There's, I, I'm more of a, a Ace Freely fan, sure. obviously. So since I didn't, I didn't care for I've got an angel. I, I scored it ten seven. Kiss. Oh, seven. Yeah, I didn't like that song. Oh, a two, yeah, a two no, knockdown. Yeah, two knockdown. Yeah, two knockdown. I didn't like it. Man, at all. I know. I'm brutal. You're beating up a fine woman like Annie Lennox. I, her vocals were too <laughs> weird. I don't know. There was something about just. It never paid song. off for you. Never paid off for me. Yeah. No. What did no. you do, Mike? I did not really like. I've got an angel. It was just too short to really establish anything. Oh boy. It's got a nice beat. I like the flute. I like the exoticness, but it's super short. Not a whole lot of depth. Yeah. Uh, then Two Thousand Man really rocks. Mm. I know it's a Stones cover. I know that you cover the Stones, you better you better pull your A game. But I think Ace brings his A game. And I was doing more research into both bands. I listened to the Unplugged, the one where the band finally got back together after, what, 17 years? Yeah. And he really kicks ass on this song, on that Unplugged. Mm. So with that fresh in my brain yeah. and just listening to the song a couple times, I kind of added it to a few of my playlists when I was done. I liked it that much. Wow. Really? Yeah. Okay. So there you go. Now, so, the question becomes, was it a two knockdown round? It was not a two knockdown round. I really don't think I've got an angel brings it enough, so I'm going ten eight. Oh boy, a knockdown nonetheless. There you go. Okay, well then, round three, <laughs> wrap it up versus sure know, sure know something. something. Well, let me kick it off then. Sure know something sounds like a classic case of a record label in control because Casablanca Records had done what they did, just like you know, in I was made for loving you. They had the band, I think, in a position where they were a little unhappy. Peter Chris had been injured. You know, there was some discord in the band. And I imagine, and this is me making up shit in my head, but I imagine that at some point Neil Bogart stepped in and said, listen, guys, you guys are getting stale, and I need you to step up your game because I got bands like Lips Inc., Donna Summer, Parliament, Cameo. I've been listening to a lot of that stuff lately. Oh, man. Honestly. Yeah, I really have. Casablanca was a great label. Yeah. And I think this is where they stepped in. So what do you do with a band like Kiss when that the rest of your roster is a, you know, essentially disco or funk? Well, that's when you take them to Studio 54 and you show them how much people like to dance and then at some point they're going to make an album like this and this is that point. So I think on the other hand, wrap it up was the Eurythmics taking someone else's composition, it was a Sam and Dave song, and attempting to make it theirs. They ran it through their process, and sometimes that works great. 
other times it works less less than great. The times that it worked great were, let's say, uh, Aretha Franklin doing Respect. That song became hers. Earth, Wind, and Fire doing Got to Get You Into My Life. That was great. Wrap It Up was not my favorite of the cover songs. And nor was Eurythmics Wrap It Up my favorite version of Wrap It Up. My favorite is the Fabulous Thunderbirds. I like their version even better than Sam and Dave. They do a great cover. Yeah. So still, I think it's enough to beat Sure Know Something. Uh, if just barely, I scored it 10-9 Eurythmics. And as I publish that score, I look to Scott Pelkey, who's probably going to beat me up. No, you might be, you <laughs> might be surprised on, for, okay. on this one. So for Sure Know Something, I made the note that I like the dynamics of the song. Okay. The guitars kind of kick in for the chorus, and I don't, it doesn't. That song doesn't entirely offend me. Same thing with "Wrap It Up." I, I wrote down my notes. It's it's got a funky vibe to it, or at least that's how I kind of was feeling it yeah. with them. But Listen, so so my notes he were. He said like, that song doesn't totally offend me. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I don't know. To me, they they both six in one hand. I I scored that round a tie eight eight. Okay, that would be. 10-10. Or 10-10? <laughs> yeah. It's got to be 10-10? 10-point ten, ten. Ten, ten, ten must. Oh, I see. Okay. I got it. So wrap it up. I also thought it was funky. Now it's super funky. Super funky. It doesn't touch the Sam and Dave version, and it doesn't come close to the Fabulous Thunderbirds. They've got the best version of that song I've heard. I think you're a very smart guy, Mike LaPerry. I have my moments. <laughs> Taking that up against Sure Know Something, yeah, it sounds kind of disco. My notes here say, here's to you, Mrs. Robinson. Ooh. Okay. So it's been done. That's that's a song about young kid falling in love with an older woman. Yeah. Pretty clearly. Yeah. Jesus loves you more than you will know. <laughs> <laughs> I actually agree with you on more than one of these tracks that I had that it's been done before feed. So I'm going wrap it up ten, sure no something nine. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Round four. Is uh, I could give you a mirror versus dirty living. Before we launch into round four, I want to talk about all the synthesizers that are here on uh, this Eurythmics album because Dave Stewart, you know, he's a th- he he's a th- he's genius. He's a genius. <laughs> here. He's a synthesizer. He's a synthesizer guy. What are your thoughts about lining up what is essentially a female vocalist on top of synthesized arrangements? Well, I really like I really like what Dave did with the synthesizers. I just did it. Yeah, synthesizers. Pete uh, Pete is cursing us all. Pete is cursing us all. He's not here for a a band that's uh, in the battle that is synthesizer based. So he loses he an has... opportunity to mispronounce synthesizer at least ten <laughs> times. At least ten times. Yeah, it's part of his charm. Uh, I like how Dave actually mixes the synthesizers with real instruments. Because if you look at the liner notes, there's there's a trumpet in there. Just, I a made a note about there. when the trumpet there's, first appears. I made a note about yeah, that. Yeah, there's there's real live bass and guitar in there. Right. Uh, there's drums in a few songs. So and there's Annie Lennox. And there's Annie Lennox, whose voice is and who, she's a pure vocalist, as pure as vocalists right. get. Yeah, yeah. There are a few better than yep. Annie. So I think still, still, uh, yeah. The mix of this techno with the classic is probably what made Eurythmics the band they are and as popular as they are. I think you're right. I think you're right. Would you say that this was the Eurythmics at their best, or do you think they got better from here? Because I think Annie Lennox got better from here. She got oh, better, yeah. but this was Eurythmics at their best. I, I, I think. disagree. I think there's a few songs that came out after this album that mm-hmm. really peaked for them. I'll throw out Would I Lie to You. Oh, song. Uh, yeah. That was yeah. a great song. Huge. That yeah. was a great song. It was a great song. And uh, as great as track one, Love is a Stranger, is, I think Here Comes the Rain Again takes that same mood and cranks it up, mm-hmm. and that's from their next album. Yeah. So I think they still had some good work ahead of them. I mean, they hit hard with Sweet Dreams. Yeah. And they became international superstars i think but a I lot of that they breaking they didn't breaking loose and getting to international superstardom came from the fact that they were really as big a part of the video expansion right, there at that time there was nobody else that was looking as androgynous yep. as annie lennox yep 
and it was, you know, everyone was like, whoa. Yeah, okay. what's going on here? What's going on here? This is cool. Yeah. And to mix that with the synth pop ability and their And, and then the, Dave and the Stewart, vocals. who was like and the d- silent right. Bob. Yeah, yeah. Of 80s synth music. You know, and allowing Annie to experiment or do with her vocals as she wanted to mm-hmm. over over what he was doing. It was yeah. phenomenal. What is your opinion about Annie? Like, how, how hot do you think Annie Lennox is? I'm of the Annie Lennox is hot camp. I think because of her vocals, yeah. that helps. Oh, of course. I, but I mean, it's like anybody I, who it, is superb at something. It's like okay, that if that person yeah, right. is a seven, yeah, suddenly yeah, they're yeah, a nine yeah. and a half right, exactly. because they're superb. Exactly. At that helps this skill. Um, but I yeah, think no, that the androgyny, is, the, the androgyny was definitely a hot thing. I wasn't, you know, I, I wasn't was into it. it when they first started as much as I got into it after I heard her sing. And then later on, as they progressed, it was just really a matter of she had short hair and a suit. Right. You right. Know? And, and once you eliminate those things and she starts singing free of the requirement to Which I think do something ca- with an image. It came on later once they established themselves. Yeah. She was able to kind of. She heated up. Heated up. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't have to rely on so much imagery. Yep. That's, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, I'm right there with so. you. What'd you think about round four, Mike LaPerry? I could give you a mirror is, is more like it after the last couple of songs. While I did like wrap it up, I didn't like some, track two, Angel. This is once again a great featuring of Annie's voice. Her voice is just superb. The track has depth, but staying tight overall. Lyrics aren't super deep, but uh, there's not a whole lot of depth on either album, really. This is kind of kitty cool. <laughs> you're you're considering, you know, consider, you know, comparing to, to Kiss lyrics, so yes. you're not. <laughs> um, <laughs> the Kiss disco album lyrics, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, 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 when I do album fight, I listen really closely to everything. I tend to be, I tend to be more focused on lyrics and singing when I'm just listening for an enjoyment purpose. But okay. for this, I listen deep. And in this track, I thought that it was mixed really, really well. The instrumentation doesn't overpower the lyrics and vocals. The vocals don't overpower the the instrumentation. I just felt that this song was really well put together. Going up against Dirty Living, though, Peter Chris finally puts in his singular appearance on this album. And this was almost kind of the end for Peter Chris and Kiss. I don't think he even appeared on the next album, even though he was on the cover. No, he did not. So the, the drumming here does... hired Eric Carr by then. Even though I think the album that came after this, Anton Fig played on it. I think so. But they he got Eric Carr on this one. and he took over on the road. I said the drumming here doesn't sound significantly different yeah. than the rest of the album. And I know they didn't have Peter because he had injuries, but also they were saying, eh, he didn't sound as good. Yeah. I don't really hear a difference when, when you get to do your round. I'd love to hear your interpretation of whether it's different with, with him on the, on the drums. Did he play the drums? He played the drums and sang on this one. Oh. On Dirty Living. Okay. I would say Peter is their second best vocalist at this point in time. Nice. I still think Paul Stanley has the best voice of the four. Hmm. He does. Ace is still learning his vocal chops by this point, and I've never been a fan of Gene Simmons' voice. He, he just tries to do the demon thing too yeah. much. So looking at my score, in a squeaker of a round, I went ahead and gave this to Kiss 10-9, Dirty Living, over. I could give you a mirror, but not an easy score Interesting. To a tight 10-9. A very tight 10-9. Scott Pelkey. Yeah. I like that the, it had good low-end synth mm-hmm. to it, which I really dug. I, I, I lean towards musically like low-end. That's what I listen to. I never listen to lyrics. I'm a drummer, so I don't know what. I for whatever reason I've never paid attention to lyrics. My man, I probably should, but I never have. I uh, but I just put so for that song I said uh, just good low end synth, kind of dark wave, and I like the vocals over it. Mm-hmm. And then so for Dirty Living, I, I made a remark definitely about Peter Chris vocals. Uh, I, th- I I've always been a fan of his vocals, and I put down it was kind of funky and gritty. I, f- I that that's the way it felt to me. Yeah, I liked the breakdown. Of the song and it's and 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 the return into it, I think we're really cool. As far as the score, I I gave the edge to Dirty Living nine eight. Can I do that? No, no. ten, no, nine, ten, ten point nine. must. See, I'm just learning this. Winner's got to have album, a ten. Fine. Yeah. Oh, I see. Winner's got to have a ten. Yeah. So, so we'll go ten nine. Ten nine Dirty Living. Ten nine Dirty Living. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. I'm figuring out this score. Yeah, this thing. is good, man. 
So one of the reasons Eurythmics became important to the music of the early to mid 80s was because they contributed to the video revolution. The other yes. reason was because Dave Stewart's electronic execution and compositions were just good. He did it well. He was experimenting with sounds just enough to be interesting, but not so much that he ever left the composition behind. Annie Lennox, she's so good as a craftsperson. So good. You know, and you, Scott, go on the road with some just superb singers. So you know that the craft of singing, it requires care and attention, and it's very strenuous, and it's... Oh, yeah, absolutely. There's so much uh, to it, and she is, as a craftsperson, just terrific. I mean, she's... Everybody knows she's a really good singer. It would be a shame to say she's underrated. I think that everybody does recognize that she's great. But I really think that she is among the true greats. I agree. And I totally agree. I don't know that she gets quite that recognition. And I hope that as she her should career... Get more, she should get more than she does. Well, she does get quite a bit. She's she also should. in the midst of a great career that is going to be an example of longevity. So I think she's absolutely going to get there, too. I think we're going to be able to look back on her tremendous body of work after it's been decades long and go, dude, she was the real, real deal. Yeah. I, I, honestly, I think she's got more to come. Yeah. For sure. We're not going to, you know, honestly, we're not going to see anything out of Kiss that's going to be worth significance. She, yeah, she's, still, but I still, she's think, still after it. I think she's still, yeah, she's still got something huge on the horizon. But I guarantee whatever we see out of Kiss, Gene Simmons will try to sell it. Oh, nice. <laughs> Everybody's good at something. Gene Simmons will sell tickets to his own funeral. Are you kidding me? He's probably pre-selling now. Yeah, he probably, probably is too. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> now, Dirty Living for me featured a strong arrangement. I like the way that you highlighted the breakdown and then the way they came back into it. That was cool. It's a departure from the usual kiss in in a way that doesn't betray usual kiss. For a kiss fan, I think this is a track that a true Kiss fan can still say, yeah, they sounded like Kiss on this one. And maybe it is Peter Chris's vocals, because let's face it, the best vocally best Kiss song was Beth. 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 So And Hard Luck Woman, because he sings that too. Yeah, right. So Peter Chris really is, he's the best singer in Kiss. This song is about hookers. Gene Simmons' bass work is nice. He's got great bass lines and makes great choices. It's not over... Done. Yeah. Some of the bass lines in, uh, on some of the other songs are way over. They, yes, he's, he's capable of going over the top. Right. This song allowed him to stretch and bend without breaking. Right. He layered tracks, so it was close. I mean, there were parts where I thought, you know what? He's layering. I know, he, I know he tracked that more than once. There are places where you can pick out that he's doing two different things on the bass, and, and it's not because of a creative reason. It's because, like, punch me in right there. But still, it was okay. It makes me wonder how they would play the song live. But guess what? We're never going to know. Because <laughs> yeah, right. they're never going to play this song live. I did like the crescendo in the background vocal. thought that was cool. I went 10-9 Kiss. Yeah. Cool. Round five Round is five. The Walk versus Charisma. Charisma. <laughs> Kick it off, Scott Pelkey. Okay. we're gonna. I'll, I'll start with uh, Charisma. The first thing I wrote down after listening... To that, or while I was listening to it, it was just Dean Simmons is a tool. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was the first thing that just instantly came to mind. The the song, the the vocal, the just. I here's what I wrote down: Dean Simmons is a tool. Dumb lyrics, bad vocals, good ace lead. It saves the song. Ace okay, lead. ace Freely's lead saves the song. Mike, you and I are gonna have to step our game up because I think Scott just walked away with the line of the fight. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how it plays out. We're only halfway through. I'm not uh, done so, yet. So then, but not, Gene I'm not, Simmons I'm not, I'm is a tool. Yet. That's pretty good. Okay. But All then right. For the, for the, and then for the walk, I, I just wrote down good synth bass. I like the vocal arrangements on it and the breakdown and the return into it was awesome. And as Mike stated earlier, that was the first, what we first hear of the trumpet, really, from Arrhythmics. And that was really awesome. It's, it's really tastefully done in that song, and I really like it a lot. So uh, the score, I, I did a, a double knockdown because I can't stand charisma. Uh, I, I did 10-7. I gave it to Arrhythmics. Wow. I really, there's every, uh, There's yeah. a lot of whooping happening in there is Scott a, for me, yeah. score card. Well, boy. <laughs> These Dynasty, I was such a Kiss fan, even at 10 years old when Dynasty came out. I was, yeah. I, it was such a letdown. Yeah. To, even this at 10, album, this even at 10 up. years old, it was this a letdown. <laughs> Okay. Who picked this? 
I'll give you one guess who's not here. Uh. <laughs> His initials are Pete Turner, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe he liked it because of all the synthesizers. All the synthesizers. <laughs> Mike? Let's start with the walk, which might be an ad for Coke. Uh. All I want is the real thing. It's a really well-built song. It's I really not like as good the as trumpet Gene solo. As a tool. It is but keep, not. keep going. I, I, I'll get to Gene in a second. <laughs> oh, okay. It's, it's another well-built song. It doesn't fall into repetitiveness like some of the other songs in this album do. It's very original, and I really liked that about it. So for charisma, I think the song should probably be called Libido because it's basically a song about Gene it, Simmons. Exactly, dead. which is my opening line. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we'll harken back to that. So we'll just call this song Libido from now on. <laughs> mm. Uh, first off, the demon persona is getting old. Second, Simmons is basically singing about how great he is in the sack, which if you have to brag, you probably shouldn't be bragging. So uh, listening on the headphones, there is a low bass voice that comes in that's a little flat also. It's just, Scott made a good point. The only thing that saves this is the rest of the band. It's an unoriginal 12-year-old talking about his dick song. That's it. Sorry, Gene, you're not that good. And I, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm going to toss out the last three songs I wrote. Um, <laughs> <laughs> guess what they're about? Gene Simmons' dick. Uh, Scott, <laughs> what were you going to say? Oh, I was just going to add to just the chorus or what it, the charisma part with the the delay or the echo or whatever oh, that is. It's it's horrible. so cheesy. It's cheesy, exactly. So that's all I wanted to throw in there. Mm. Yeah, well, I think neither of us like this song <laughs> yeah. that much. Okay, uh, well, 10, 8, Eurythmics. T- uh, okay, a, a knockdown round. I went double Not knockdown. a double knockdown, but a knockdown nonetheless. Yeah. Okay, here's where you guys are wrong. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Gene Simmons is a lead vocalist. We agree is terrible. This is the Andy Summers song on a police album. And I love Andy Summers, but that's what I think of when I think of Gene Simmons singing about his cock. <laughs> I'm not in a position to say, Gene Simmons, you should probably quit singing about your cock because you probably aren't as good as you think that dude fucking slayed a lot of tail. So, okay, if that's what you want to sing about, Gene, that's great, but I don't have to vote for it. The band compromises. You know, I like the lyrics, but not because I liked the lyrics. I think what I've learned from Scott is that as a drummer, I listen to lyrics and I love catchy lyrics when they pop up and go oh, and, and you know really get your attention. Other than that, I like the lyrics for their rhythmic right contribution. Right, that's what I I listen to more of the rhythm than yeah what they're really. So about. the fact that he was singing about his cock was really deep secondary, and honestly, I you know was going along with the rhythm of the lyrics and enjoying it without giving any credence to you know the content. Or the message. The walk is cool if you're studying composition in the framework of electronic music. Um, When I learned to mix, I learned based on the building of a song and the emotional response that comes with the building blocks. Like a pyramid. You start with the low end and you figure out what to pile on on top of that. And if you do it tactfully and tastefully, you end up with a song that moves you and you end up with a song that sonically just makes you feel good. The walk was kind of that. It wasn't terrific, but it was pretty good. I scored it 10-9 the walk. Round six. <laughs> Sweet dreams are made of this versus magic touch. Sweet dreams is more adventurous. It's more dynamic. It's more textured. It's groundbreaking and everything that we've been talking about with the blending of Dave Stewart and his technical prowess and the organic nature of Annie Lennox and the vocals and the striking point of her androgyny in the image of the song. It was dark. It was different. Everything from the engineering through the mix and the mastering is technically better. Magic Touch just takes one on the chin and hits the canvas. Now, I didn't score it a double knockdown, but it got knocked down hard and had to take a count all the way to nine, which means that I scored a 10-8 Sweet Dreams. Mike, what did you do? So, Sweet Dreams, what can you say about this song that hasn't been said? I'll yeah. try. It's it's their career-defining song. You it can say that Gene Simmons their... is a tool. 
Sorry. <laughs> I think anyone can say yeah. Gene Simmons is a tool. <laughs> uh, this is their career definer. But it's not just a career definer. It really is a catchy song. Mm-hmm. It has, again, a little bit of depth to it. I focus on vocals and lyrics. Everybody knows that about me. Looking through the lyrics, this is one of the ones where I actually went out and looked at the lyrics on screen. Ah. Some of them want to use you. Some of them want to get used by you. Some of them want to abuse you. Some of them want to be abused. Mm-hmm. Which, digging into this, they were talking about how they were really kind of getting a raw deal after their first album went nowhere, more than you know the BDSM that people, I think, probably equate with that. But that's really how people treat other people sometimes. So I think that there's there's actually some depth to this. It isn't just the big MTV flash. Uh, it's a it's a great song, Magic Touch. Uh, welcome back, Paul Stanley. Thanks for taking the microphone away from Gene Simmons. <laughs> <laughs> but it's another song about sex. What a shocker! And Kiss has the depth of a kiddie pool. <laughs> that might be the best one yet. <laughs> <laughs> Who? True, and, st- true uh, statement. It's it's going up against just one of the juggernauts from its from from the opponent album. Yeah. Uh this is this is a weak song on on this album. And that's saying something. <laughs> oh, wow. So, I am going 10-8 in favor of Sweet Dreams. Okay. Yeah. Scott, Sweet Dreams, we'll start off with that. It's got a great synth hook. Mhm. It's their, you know, like you guys said, it's their breakout song. It's the one that everybody that made everybody stand up and just kind of go, "Whoa." Who were these guys? Was Mm -hmm. this synth awesomeness? The vocals were phenomenal. You can't go wrong with the the you know Annie's vocals or or, uh, she's on her A game with this. And and to me, the lead I guess with the synth in Sweet Dreams, the whole hook, the whole everything to me is just was just amazing. And then we get to Magic Touch. (laughs) I put slow, boring, and my see my whole thing. I always mention the breakdowns. Breakdowns are quintessential i think for songs Mm -hmm. it was it's horrible again horrible horrible effects boards is horrible everything um i scored it 10 8 sweet dreams okay well we were unanimous on that one oh yeah (laughs) round seven is jennifer versus hard times that was a tough one for me it was oh well lead it lead us off well jennifer is it's interesting i wrote down it's interesting it's kind of airy. It's open. It's still kind of poppy, and I and I said it sort of reminds me of a little more avant-garde, Joy Division-y, just musically, maybe not vocally. I don't know. It, that that's and I kind of dug it. Uh, hard times. It kind of went nowhere for me. I didn't like it. Uh, again, I just put down Ace and his lead. Yeah, are the only saving grace of the song. And Ace and his leads are like the only saving grace of the entire album. Well, For, uh, okay, that's what I think. I mean, it's certainly on some of on where because some of the songs he doesn't even have a, he doesn't even really play lead guitar. To, yeah. uh, on, but I don't know. That's that's the way I feel, and I I gave it to Eurythmics though ten eight. Okay, Mike, what'd you do? So Jennifer is the longest second. Sorry, second longest song in the album. The final song is the longest one. Mm-hmm. And it has 20 unique words. I, I pulled up the lyrics and counted it. So so not a whole lot to this song, considering that they've got five minutes to work with. Uh, but it's a good song. I mean, I, I, it's sonically a good song. It's great to listen to. Doing the work for Album Fight, you want to go deeper. So I was looking for... I was looking for more, and I know that the Eurythmics are capable of more. I think they could have done a lot more with this song. Musically, it's it's really, really, really impressive. But lyrically and even vocally, there's not there's not a whole lot there. But then it goes up against Hard Times, and this is Hard Times for this album. They can Ace can be better. He can do so much better. Vocally, he's just not there in this song doesn't really hit good notes throughout musically it's better musically uh, i thought it was one of the better songs on the album saving grace lyrically and uh lyrically and vocally 
they can do better and there's dozens of songs out there yeah we get it you grew up in a tough neighborhood but you could do so much more if you put some time in on this one so both of these songs to me were letdowns because i know in both cases that the bands are capable of more than they delivered so this is a tough one especially since that's not the way i scored it when i first did the scorecard so thinking this through I am going to edge this one out to the Eurythmics 10-9, but I, I think that they're really close, um, but not for a good reason. Hmm. They're really close for a bad reason. <laughs> for the bad 10, reason. I'll go 10-9, Eurythmics, barely. Okay. Hard Times is Kiss letting Anton Fig loose a little bit. He had been working with Ace Freely, worked on that Freely's Comet album, so when Peter Chris was injured, he was an easy guy to bring in. And... For our listeners who are not aware, Anton Fig is a fucking monster. That dude is a monster. Amazing. I mean, really one of the greatest living drummers today. It's underrated. Absolutely. I mean, drummers here's today. the thing. He was in David Letterman's band with Paul Schaefer for 30-some-odd mm-hmm. years. Ooh. And in that long of a run, he played with so many people just because of the people that came through the Letterman show. That list includes Miles Davis, James Brown, Bruce Springsteen, Steve Winwood, Bonnie Raitt, right. Tony Bennett, Stevie Wonder, Faith Hill, Little Richard, B.B. King. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. David Bowie, Mick Jagger, Keith Richards, Eric Clapton, Buddy Guy, many times, Macy Gray, wow. James Taylor. Who's got this resume? Right. And not only that, but when Paul Schaefer was sick, guess who MD'd the band? Anton Fig did. The dude is a monster, and it, when he's going to play on your album, you got to let him cut loose a little right. bit. He was tasty. He did so with just great chops, but never tried to do too much. You know, for the Eurythmics, I'm just going to look at Pelkey for this one. The, Jennifer is a five-minute, ten-second song with no snare drum. Fuck that. I don't mind, but I see how not mind that. it, though. I, I need it to go somewhere. <laughs> okay, maybe I don't need a snare drum. I need a snare drum. I need a backbeat someplace. Sure, I can dig it. But if you're going to deny me a backbeat, just take the song somewhere. So, you know, not my favorite. Actually, texturally, you know, it's a pretty neat sounding song, but five minutes of it was a little much. I scored it a knockdown round 10 8 hard times. Ooh. Ooh, wow. Anton Fig, man. Anton Fig does not get his due. So, no, not at all. There you but, go. Wow. Yeah. Uh, round eight. This is The House versus X-Ray Eyes. X-Ray Eyes is hard for me to listen to. It's an overdramatic melody. And, you know, rock and roll in the late 70s took a few different turns. There was good time rock and roll. There was rock and roll that included some drama that was glam there were influences from a lot of places punk and i wasn't too big a fan of the over dramatic melodies that rock was capable of giving us and this is a great example of it i've had my fill of gene simmons lyrics let's face it uh, not the greatest lyricist as as le perry said the the depth of a kiddie pool <laughs> you know i just my ears are fatigued by the time X-Ray Eyes shows up. This is the house. Yeah, it was okay. Not great, but did have horns, which, uh, you know, which is okay. And and there was some bass in there as well. And so just because we like that organic mix of real instruments with synthesis and they were willing to go there and did a pretty good job of it, I'll go ahead and vote for This is the House 10-9. What'd you do, Mike? So I found This at the House to be a little bit repetitive, Mm -hmm. just a little bit. But it was one of the other ones that stuck with me after the fight. I had this one popping into my head also. That's what happens with repetitive, though, sometimes. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. But it is a great performance by Annie Lennox. If you listen really closely in this song, you can hear a little bit of craft work, too. Uh, Which every single techno band in the early 80s should be down on their knees. Kissing craftwork and most hip hop groups. Yeah, true. Uh, no, craftwork doesn't get their due. We need to do an album. Not fight a, with them. Right? Yeah, yeah. You know what I this should have been? Chime in with me here, fellas. We should have done a better Kiss album against Thin Lizzy. That was Scott's idea. 
And then we should have done this Eurythmics album against the Kraftwerk, Kraftwerk. album. Yeah. I think Kraftwerk would have kicked their ass. Well, well maybe, but we would but have had a comparison that allowed us to sort of really pull apart what was in there. True, true. I'm with you on that one. I, I don't... And Kraftwerk didn't have Annie Lennox. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's right. true. And they if there was not. any anything that you could create an advantage with, if you're going up against a juggernaut like Kraftwerk, it'd be you got to bring Annie Lennox. Well, it, yeah, it, I mean, yeah, it's, vo- it's vocals vocally, in general. Yeah. If you're going to bring two, yeah, it's always, I think, vocals will put two tying mu- musical bands, mm-hmm. but you get a vocal that'll put any band over the top. Yeah. It doesn't matter who yeah. it is, what it is. Yeah. I don't, yeah. I don't ding rhythmics for a Kraftwerk ish. Sound because they're the pioneers of this. Who do you industry. think Dave Stewart was probably listening to? Exactly. <laughs> uh, whereas X Ray Eyes, uh, there's nothing original in this song. Nothing original. Uh, vocally, Simmons is better than Libido. <clears throat> Charisma, sorry. Yes. But not by much. And he is capable of better. If you if you look at some of the other songs he does sing on, Rock and Roll All Night is him, and that's one of their best songs. If you look at some of the later stuff, there's they had a horrible album with a decent song. Uh, later on, uh, World Without Heroes from The Elder, which was, I think, their worst-selling album ever. But it's not a bad song from Simmons, showing that he can sing if he if he tries. In this song, I don't really think he put a lot of effort into it, both from the singing and the writing perspective. X-Ray Eyes That See Through Lies, Do You Have Green Eggs and Ham? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do not want them, Sam I Am. <laughs> You're going down, Gene. That's Sorry. fucked up. This is the house 10 9 to X ray eyes. Uh, Scott? Me. Uh, interesting. I kind of went opposite direction for you guys Uh-oh. on this round. Uh, I'll start with X ray eyes. The song sort of moves a little bit. It's not the worst one on the album. And and Gene's vocals, they're lyrically, they're, he's still a tool, but the vocals are slightly better, I think, on this than, than some of his other songs that he sings on the album. And then Eurythmics, This House, I just didn't like it. That song did nothing for me. Mm. For whatever, I just, I couldn't get into it at all. Uh, Some people don't like grape soda. Yeah. You get to not like it. That's why we brought you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. (laughs) But I scored that, I went with Kiss. I went 10-8 on that one. Oh. Yeah, that's how much I Gene Simmons' vocals knocking somebody down. I know. That's just how much I didn't. Unfortunately, Mike I, didn't, Perry. I, didn't, I didn't like that song. Rebuttal on Gene Simmons' vocals knocking somebody down. Uh, maybe his breath. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, he's – but that's the thing. Gene, he, he does have vocal range when he wants to show it. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I did agree but, with and like you, you said, that he, this he, is better than the other right. song he and, and Because he doesn't necessarily try to do that demon thing yeah. on yeah. here. Yeah. It, it is a better performance from Gene. I just – you know. But how much, I mean, you know, that's not a real big step. Agree to disagree <laughs> or to quote Pete, as he often says to me during other album fights, I think you're fucking wrong. <laughs> okay. And we'll just have to agree with that. Yeah, I'll go with that. Absolutely. All right. Well, round nine, and this may be the final round, or uh, we may need a tiebreaker, but this is the final round Kiss is fighting This in. is the final round. So... Uh, we have Somebody Told Me versus Save Your Love. Let's start with Scott Pelkey. He's the guest in the house. Okay. Right away, Scott. I'll go with Save Your Love. I kind of like it. Chorus. Ace, again, comes through in the song really well. And then the other, uh, what was it? Somebody Told Me? Somebody yep. Told Somebody. Me. To me, I, did, I wrote down, It's to me, it's kind of noisy. Mm-hmm. Didn't really go anywhere. I think Save Your Love was, was slightly a, a, a more of a moving song. Just... Progressed better, song wise. I went. I went double knockdown. I went ten seven. Oh, oh! I didn't like. I didn't. I didn't like how the Eurythmics album ended. The last. Yeah. Co- the last couple songs. Hmm. I. I think it, it ended kind of weak, and and obviously with with Dynasty, it ended a little stronger. Yeah. On my last two scores, so. I've been involved in the production process of digital music, and when you're using sequencers, sometimes it's easy to let a groove just go right and if it's a groove that that feels good it's easy to let it go and i think that that's what happened with somebody told me is that dave stewart had this groove that he thought that caught him for one reason or another and he let it go and he let it go on too long and there was not a lot of building on it that i thought was really of any consequence Uh, i agree with you that the song just was stagnant it didn't build properly right 
It was weird. That's, that's kind of how I felt. It just didn't build properly. Yeah. Save Your Love is almost a guilty pleasure for me. I know it's bad. But I that's kind of how I felt about it. But it was the other earworm right. on this Kiss album. It was, I found myself singing it. It was like, it's got that chanty kind of chorus that save it. It's the chorus. Save it. And it's, Christy cleaned out the refrigerator earlier. What are we going to do with these mushrooms? Save it. Save it. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so that's something that I'm going to take away from this album. And, and one of the pleasures of this experience um, ended up being Save Your Love, which again is to me not that great a song, but. Sometimes you look at a dog and you go, that dog is ugly. That's an ugly dog. Come here, ugly dog. I kind of like you. you Sometimes you love those ugly dogs. That's right. (laughs) So I went Save Your Love. Not a knockdown round for me, but I did uh, squeak out uh, the win uh, on this round with Save Your Love. Mike LaPerry gets the last word on the last round. What do you say, Mike? Somebody told me... Nice groove, simple song. They're still being more original, I think, than Kiss, even all the way to the last song on mm. uh, on the album. Uh, I was getting ear fatigue through uh, through Save Your Love. I was just kind of Kiss fatigued out by the time by the time I got to it. But it is definitely a better offering from Ace than Hard Times was. Mm. And uh, again, Ace, I agree with Scott. Ace is the best thing on this album. And uh, it's not surprising that he went off on his own a couple albums later and and just said, I got to do my own thing. I'm not down with with Gene. Had enough of you assholes. (laughs) Yeah, because Gene is. Anton, come with me. A tool. (laughs) That's why why Ace had the best. Ace and just to get off a sidetrack, Ace and Peter had the best solo album. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The four out of the four of them. They were by far the best. So not necessarily in that order. Not necessarily in that order. But it kind (laughs) of to me, it just shows you kind of where the talent is with those guys. So what I said about Save Your Love is there's nothing particularly bad about Save Your Love. It's right. it's a standard kiss song mm-hmm. and and it's just generally I did enjoy bad. It. Nothing particularly bad. <laughs> no, there's nothing particularly bad about it. I, I I could you know, if I dig I can probably find some stuff I really didn't like, but it was yeah. it was okay. Yeah. If it was a girl, it'd be eh, she's kinda homely. Uh, not you know terribly wrong with her. She's yeah, just but, home. but let me ask you: Could that song go on any other Kiss album as opposed to Charisma? Yeah, you couldn't. You couldn't put Charisma on Rock and Roll Over. Yeah, yeah. This, but you could this probably song could put, have been. But on this Love one, Gun you could write. Or, this, right. Yeah, this is a yeah. song for. This right. is a song for Kiss fans. Yeah. Right. So I had uh, I had Save Your Love edging out. Somebody told me ten nine. All right. Somebody told me it's 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 a good rhythmic song, but it's not. It's not the best song in the album, not close. Mm. So, so, if we look at our scores, we have two judges giving the fight to one and one judge with a tie. Oh. So, John and I both gave this fight to the Arrhythmics. John is 85-84, so close. Wow. Wow. Uh, Mike is eighty six, eighty two. So I gave Ooh. I gave a lot more rounds to the arithmetic here. Rhythmics. And Scott is a flat out eighty one, eighty one. How tie is that even possible? <laughs> because of all your double knockdowns, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Some I. That's, yeah. hey, that's how I felt. Though. Both of Some these of acts those. come come away from this fight concussed. Conc- they're both. It's a, it's, Scott's card. It's a bloody My mess. Card. It's going to be it's some CTE. Knockdown, right. It is, it is. It is a bloody mess. I so. mean, some knee scabs. But some of the songs on Dynasty are just... They're, de- they're terrible. They're terrible. They're terrible. Ter- they deserve a double knockdown. Yeah. I knew when I saw the early numbers that this was going to be a very different fight. And boy, it was. Easily the most knockdowns of any fight so far with Sweet Dreams getting knocked down themselves five times and Dynasty getting knocked down seven. That's 12 total knockdowns in one fight. They have got to be sore today. Of note, Eurythmics scored five of their nine points in favored rounds, but Kiss only maintained two of their nine points. Also of note, Sweet Dreams had three sweep rounds. Kiss even had two sweep rounds themselves. But really the story here is round six, and Sweet Dreams are made of these. Not only did it sweep the round, but it also got three knockdowns scored against Kiss. That's a six-point swing, and the final tally was 252 
to 247. Five points. That one point may, probably made the difference here. We predicted a weird one, and a weird one it was, but it was very fun. Back to you guys. Neil Bogart, he died young, and I don't think he really, I don't remember what killed him, but he partied hard. He partied hard. And Casablanca Records was a great label. They eventually uh, became a part of Polygram. Oh, they, is that where they ended up? Yeah, that's where that. they ended up. Um, they, they exist again, although not in any related way. Uh, I think Polygram um, eventually melted in with Universal or spun it off to Universal. And Tommy Mottola took it mm-hmm. and said, I always liked Casablanca Records. I'm going to restart Casablanca Records and uh, sign my own acts to it. And So he's doing that now with Casablanca. So, again, they're alive but not in any related way to their previous work. But they are cemented in history as a record label that did some pretty amazing things. I agree. And, Absolutely. You know, so this this album happened to be a part of their evolution, and I would liken this album to be the uh, year that Ted Williams changed his stance <laughs> and uh, decided to take a new approach, and that was a terrible year. It was, it was a terrible <laughs> <laughs> the, because of that, I stopped buying Kiss records yeah. after Dynasty. Wow, that's how. I mean, it, you know, that's yeah, they ruined how, it. They ruined it, and that and that was also there. They they came out. I, I believe that's when they came out with their their new costumes. It was a whole new yeah look for them. It was trying to reinvent. Yeah, it was. Kiss. A, it, it, their, their, co- costumes their costumes were, looked a little more disco. They too. were bad costumes with a bad album. It's sequins. And, Mirrors. Just, yeah, they just, I don't know. They tried to go, like, Mike, they, they were trying to go disco. Yeah. And in, what they ended own... up with was a Dutch oven. Right. Mm-hmm. I don't know. They just ended up with bad all the way around. Yeah. Because it wasn't that, how, how many more albums after Dynasty did they finally take their makeup off? I think Unmasked came two albums came after two this. albums after, so they yeah. had to do something. No, it, was, it was Dynasty Unmasked. Yeah, it was. Uh, Unmasked. Oh, Unmasked yeah. came next. Yes, yes, yes. And then there was one more after that that Peter Chris was on, but not really on. Yeah. And then they took their makeup off. Wow. So, yeah, I don't know. So yeah, this was this was this was Kiss circling the toilet. <laughs> okay. I, I well, don't listen, we I don't get you very records. often. I have the pleasure of working with Mike quite frequently, but we don't get Scott Pelkey very uh, often. So the next time we do this, guy. Scott, we're really going to. And now that give I give you a I, lot I, more I get, input, I get, I get a, I got a, a better understanding in the matchup. Of what's going on. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So you're gonna get a lot more input on the I'll, matchup. I'll We're gonna that. have a better matchup. Uh, there was a lot that was forgettable about Dynasty. <laughs> it made Scott Pelkey quit buying Kiss albums. It did. Oh. Although I got, I, I do have to admit though, it is because of Peter Chris, and I can specifically name Peter Chris as to why I am a drummer. Yeah, he was one of my biggest influences. There were certain bands that had where the drummer was the coolest guy in the band. And one. I think that about Kiss. I do too. That's he was one of my biggest influences. I have one more Kiss story before we sign off. Uh-huh. In fourth grade, at the Robert Semple <laughs> talent show in the spring, me and three other guys dressed up as Kiss, makeup and all, and lip synced to "Shock Me" from Love Gun. We were a hit. Everyone loved us. Which That's is going an ace, for it's it. an Ace Freely song. It is. That's going for it. Boy, I hear that laughter in the background it. over there. What's going on in the peanut gallery? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody remembers that performance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've got was to, somebody there? <laughs> I've got to dig up some pictures. Wow. That's I think amazing. Pete, Pete was there, I'm pretty sure. Pete That's was amazing. There. He went to the same school. So. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, gentlemen. That was great. Thank you. That was a great conversation. Now, now, if not, if not a terrific fight, it was a great was conversation. Think so? Now that I know what I'm doing, it'll be better next time. I yeah. Well, yeah. now that you know what you're doing, let's do another one. Thanks, right. guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.